feel anxious and, and to be uh, worried and, and uncertain and, and uh, tired and, and isolated for many people. And these are really natural feelings. Uh, but that's why I think coming together as you do uh, as a community and through a neighborhood council is more crucial than ever before. So I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, the uh, state of the city's finances, some resources that are available to navigate the crisis. And uh, then I'd be happy to open it up for questions. Uh, first, uh, let me share with you, uh, we have in our, uh, uh, on our website, a COVID-19 virus tracker. Uh, it includes a heat map uh, with case rates per 100,000. You can look at it community by community. It should be coming up on your screen any minute. And uh, you can see exactly how many cases uh, diagnosed within the Studio City area, as well as how many unfortunate um, deaths there have been. Uh, you can see it by ethnicity, by race, uh, by age, uh, and as I mentioned, by uh, community and by gender. Sorry, sir. Um, um, Randy, can you give me access to share my screen? Yeah, try it again now. Okay, thank you. So hopefully you'll see that uh, showing up any second now. Um, and, and it's a heat map, as I mentioned, and, and you can at your leisure uh, check out these numbers. You can see exactly the numbers for Studio City in front of you. Um, I uh, also have a job loss map looking at community by community in Los Angeles. Uh, and you can see exactly what the job losses have been uh, in the Studio City area. Uh, and you can look at it by also industry how many of those jobs are in construction versus educational services versus information uh, versus uh, manufacturing and much more. And it really gives a sense of uh, not just uh, the uh, magnitude, but also a real sense of uh, what the challenges are now and going forward. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation and it doesn't even really capture the full picture because there are so many people who are self-employed, uh, small business owners who are underemployed, making less than they did before. Uh, but our economy is very dependent on travel, on tourism, on entertainment, uh, on certain kinds of services that are the ones that have taken the biggest hit during the uh, uh, COVID crisis. And it's gonna take us quite a while to recover from this. Uh, it also, the map shows that some of the uh, greatest burden of many of these job losses are within uh, communities that already faced a lot of challenges, including uh, many communities of color. Uh, the uh, next thing that you're going to see is a little bit about the finances of the city. Our uh, uh, revenue forecasting that we do is always extremely accurate. Uh, this year that changed radically in March, and uh, we have yet to see exactly where the numbers are going to be right now. Our biggest source of revenue, which is property tax, is still doing well. Uh, the residential market has uh, uh, been on fire, uh, interestingly enough, uh, thanks to uh, low interest rates, but we'll see how long that can be sustained. Uh, but we have seen a tremendous drop in our hotel tax, in uh, sales tax, in other very important revenues for the city. So what does that mean for the budget? And as you mentioned, uh, there is uh, now a fiscal emergency that has been officially declared. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, the city is uh, going to be undertaking, still uh, subject to negotiations with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the labor units that represent various uh, groups of folks who work for the city. But uh, we're looking at furloughs for many of the civilian workers, actually about 15,000 out of 50,000. Uh, because it will not apply, at least as currently uh, conceived, but that can change, to the uh, sworn employees, which are police and fire, uh, would not apply to the proprietary departments of the city, which include the Department of Water and Power and the airport and the Port of LA. But it can impact a lot of very basic services, everything from tree trimming to street paving uh, to uh, much more. Um, let me also note that while it may not apply to the sworn officers of the city, uh, if uh, in fact it applies to the civilian workers who work for LAPD, that means that if they're not there, some of their roles get filled by more expensive police officers uh, doing civilian work. And uh, that can also impact uh, the, uh, the LAPD in a whole variety of different ways. 
uh, we can we can talk a lot about the budget changes uh, uh, if there are questions about that. Um, what is uh, keeping us afloat in many ways is first of all that uh, some of these revenue sources continue to come in. Second of all, we have uh, a, a strong reserve that we built, but a lot of that is getting eroded. I'll be frank, and uh, also that we've received a, a very a strong amount of federal dollars. Uh, and uh, those monies are uh, about $750 million, uh, which are being used for a whole variety of different purposes. Um, some have been spent for testing, some for microloan program, uh, some for uh, uh, rent relief. Uh, 100 million is being set aside for homeless uh, recovery. Uh, 40 million for small business and nonprofits, uh, 50 million dollars for a local paycheck uh, assistance program, uh, 5 million for a COVID-19 street vending recovery fund, uh, and it's not yet determined exactly how these funds will all be spent. It's subject to discussion by council, and I think it's very important that uh, that all members of the community and uh, neighborhood councils, particularly, uh, really take an active role in helping to shape. Uh, the priorities of how some of that money is going to be spent. And in fact, neighborhood councils, the primary role is to, uh, to actually have a say and have a role in looking at the uh, quality and the type of services that are being offered by the city. Um, we've also had, uh, as many of you know, uh, limits on evictions, uh, expanded testing, 1 million tests since March the 20th. Uh, uh, ramped up senior meals, although not nearly enough. Um, Project Room Key, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, for hotel rooms for those experiencing homelessness. We'll see how long that goes on and in what format that is. Uh, it's a very much a stopgap measure uh, given the, uh, the gravity of the uh, homeless crisis that we have. Uh, among the things that I do as controller is do audits, as I think you uh, probably all know. And I've been very critical of how uh, the city and other agencies have handled the crisis of homelessness, uh, both in terms of how LASA, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, as well as uh, the uh, program for building of uh, uh, homeless housing, Triple H, almost four years since the uh, voters approved $1.2 billion. We've gotten about 100 units out of them, uh, which is uh, nothing short of, quite frankly, criminal. Uh, people perhaps with good intentions, but uh, not performing. And I have another audit of that coming out in another week that is going to go in depth on that. Uh, and we've also had microloans uh, given to some small businesses. Uh, we've mapped actually where all those microloans go, so you know exactly every business that got it, what kind of business they are, where they're located, how much money they got, and much more. Uh, and what industries they've been in, in terms of hospitality, manufacturing, professional services, and more. Um, let me share with you briefly uh, the controller's uh, resource hub that we created. And on that hub, uh, we have uh, a lot of information, uh, including uh, these boxes that you're going to see in a second uh, that are for uh, those who are uh, small businesses, freelancers and artists, nonprofits, employers, employees, seniors, renters, homeowners. And we are updating this on a daily basis with information. Uh, that is uh, local, state, national, nonprofit. Uh, you can click on any of these uh, uh, any of these boxes and find out information uh, about uh, what is available to you and uh, to your business and to your nonprofit. Uh, we also include a lot of business information for CARES Act, the LA CARES Corps, uh, business resiliency toolkit, uh, the business resource centers of the city. Uh, the uh, Small Business Finance Center of California's iBank, and, uh, and much, much more. I could go into depth on these, but, uh, but I just want to kind of give you a small little taste of, of what's available to be seen. Uh, I've also always been in very concerned about the level of food insecurity in Los Angeles with so many people who do not have work. Uh, people are having trouble just getting basic groceries. And so I have mapped every single one of the food banks and food pantries in the Los Angeles area, as well as throughout the state. 1,800 of them are mapped. You can click on any one of these dots, see what their hours are, see information about what they provide, where they're located, and much more. And uh, 
it's also a good resource if you're interested in volunteering uh, what is in your neighborhood. Uh, I will say that I'm, I'm gratified that people are using this map. I'm also deeply distressed to say that it is the number one feature of our website, which tells me an awful lot about the level of food insecurity that is in our midst right now. Um, we've also got an LGBTQ plus a youth resource map, uh, a uh, uh, very uh, significant portion of our homeless youth uh, identifies LGBTQ plus. And uh, I wanted to make sure that on their, uh, on their own devices, on their phones, they'd be able to see what is in their neighborhood that is helpful to them uh, so that they can hopefully uh, not end up on the streets. And if they are uh, on the street to hopefully get off of the street as soon as possible. Uh, we also, of course, have the virtual checkbook of the city. A big part of uh, the role that I play uh, as controller has been to really open up the finances and the operations of the city for everybody to see. I think transparency is the best disinfectant, as they say. And uh, you can see every single expenditure that we've had in the last 10 years in the city. You can search by word, you can search by vendor, you can search by department, and much, much more. Uh, we also include every single, uh, and you can type in the word Studio City, for example. Uh, you'll see businesses that are in Studio City uh, that uh, we've contracted with. You'll see expenditures of the uh, Studio City Neighborhood Council. You'll see many other uh, different uh, uh, expenditures. Uh, and we also have uh, all the city accounts. In addition to the general fund, there's something like 700 funds, uh, including some that are very area specific to Studio City, among other areas. Uh, you can see 40 columns of data of what's going in, what's going out, uh, how much is committed, how much is uncommitted, and the name of the one individual in the city responsible for that fund, and their phone number, and their email. It's really to create a radical transparency. Uh, a few other little things I'll share with you, and then uh, again, I'll open it up. Uh, the um, property panel is a mapping of every single property that is owned in the city of LA. Uh, we, the city, are the largest owner of real estate. Uh, but there's also a lot of real estate owned by the city, by the not just the city, the county, metro, federal, state, LAUSD. Uh, it was never mapped before, and everything that you see color here in front of you is a property that is owned by a government entity. And my interest is in seeing how, even if we leverage just a a small percentage of these, imagine the amount of good that we can create in terms of everything from open space to gardens to uh, much needed places for. Uh, senior or low income or homeless housing or other much needed uh, community development. And uh, there's tremendous potential and tremendous value that is there. Most of these properties will stay exactly as they are, wonderful parks, municipal buildings, but we can definitely look at opportunities to, especially at this time, to uh, leverage some of the things that we have. Um, I'll, uh, I'll finish out with uh, a map that is on the lighter side. And uh, we all need a little bit of that these days. Uh, and uh, I recently completed an audit looking at uh, art that is owned by the city of LA uh, and public art particularly. And while our museums are closed, there's still a lot of outdoor art. Uh, everything from mosaics uh, at the Sun Valley Metrolink station to uh, sidewalk art uh, in the form of a Monopoly game uh, in Westwood to sculptures at the Wilmington waterfront. And we've mapped all of those so you can stay in your car, you can be socially distanced uh, and still uh, get out a little bit and uh, at least take in some of the public art that we have in this uh, great city of Los Angeles. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, finish out by saying that while these are challenging times, I, I also like to think of myself as an optimist. Uh, I'm the first in my family to be born in this country. And uh, my parents came uh, with that dream of realizing that American dream from themselves and their kids. Uh, and thankfully they were able to do so. And my desire is to make sure that we do that for the next generation and the next generation after that. And we have a lot of creative people. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of wonderful assets here in Los Angeles. And uh, we can also learn from this COVID crisis, uh, growth in telemedicine and making uh, medical care uh, over, uh, over your screen more available to more people, remote learning opportunities, new types of jobs, 
a hopefully more accessible government. So you don't have to get in your car and spend half a day and schlep to City Hall uh, to have your voice heard, but uh, can instead hopefully uh, find a way to have uh, input uh, by uh, zooming in. Uh, I'm seeing uh, more flexibility for uh, employees, uh, less traffic hopefully as a result of that. And, uh, and for myself, now that I'm Zooming, I'll introduce you to, I don't get to do this when I go to a regular neighborhood council meeting. This is Eli. Say hello, Eli. Uh, actually, we've got uh, a uh, uh, twins, a girl and a boy, and tomorrow they turn one year old. So, uh, wow, mazel tov. I, I, beautiful. Thank you. So, I get to uh, attend a neighborhood council meeting and still uh, participate in bath time and putting them to bed. So, nice. so this is this is the last day of your first year. Are you excited, Eli? Mwah. <laughs> he has a lot to say. No. <laughs> very, very nice. Um, so uh, with that, I, I just want to thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. I'm, I'm seeing incredible work on the part of neighborhood councils in terms of outreach and helping people who are homebound and so much more. And uh, uh, I um, uh, am very grateful for all that it is that you do because you're really there on the, on the ground in, in so many different ways. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I greatly appreciate that. Um, I, again, I thank you for taking your time. I want to hit the ground running. Before we'll open it up for a couple of questions, but already sure. in the q and A, I I thought there were some, uh, a number of interesting questions, uh, one of which is as it relates to uh, Project Room Key. Yes. And if the city is collecting occupancy taxes on any of these units, um, on, well, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting, um, hold on one second. I'm going to introduce you to the second half of the twins. This is Maya, who's about to go to bed. Can you say hello, Maya? <laughs> Mwah. Beautiful, very nice. <laughs> um, you know, there's still aspects of that that are, are uh, kind of being uh, worked out. My, my number one interest is to make sure that uh, we, we strike the best deal that we can. Uh, as well as get as many people off the street as we possibly can. Uh, we, you know, whether we collect the room tax or not, to me, is, um, uh, is really doesn't make that much of a difference because we'd be paying it and we'd be getting it. So it, it really doesn't make a difference when all is said. Right. And when you, when you talk about getting the best deal as an example, just to, you know, in Studio City, for example, and we even had a, a community conversation just before this one yeah. um, with Project Room Key at the Sportsman's Lodge Hotel here in Studio City. Uh, and they're getting $120 a night, um, but there's a, their contract says, for example, there's a 70% after two, actually after three weeks, there's a 70% uh, guaranteed minimum that the hotel will collect from the city regardless of whether it's being fully occupied or not. Right. And so I just wonder, because you mentioned, and, and, I, and I think many people appreciate that you've been uh, very tough on how the city is spending money. Is there uh, any intent on auditing Project Room Key, seeing where these dollars have been spent? Have taxpayer dollars actually, you know, highest and best use of our dollars? Is that something no. that often depends? Uh, it's definitely something that we are going to be looking into. Uh, let me say a couple things. That sure. uh, there are uh, uh, quite a number of other jurisdictions in California where it's been a lot more troublesome, uh, where uh, money was paid for rooms that were totally unoccupied. Uh, for the most part, that has not really been the case, thankfully, in Los Angeles. Um, what we've also seen in a number of other cities, and we saw examples of this, unfortunately, in San Francisco, uh, where uh, there was a you know damage done to hotel rooms, where there was a uh, uh, you know, a lot of other issues in terms of, um, you know, be it, be it drugs or, or other kind of problems that uh, resulted. Um, we have not seen uh, that level, uh, thankfully, in Los Angeles, partly because of uh, staff that has been assigned uh, to these hotels. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in actually getting more people in more of these rooms is the, is the staff to also make sure that stuff doesn't go wrong uh, and that you're also trying to... Uh, to help the people who, who get into that room because it's not going to be a permanent situation. Now, is this the most efficient way to house people? Absolutely not. Um, is this the most cost-effective way? Absolutely not. 
um, has it been a good way to avoid um, uh, what otherwise would have been a, uh, uh, an even greater disaster? Uh, yes. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, what everybody had predicted, including myself, uh, was that you would see a, a tremendous incidence of COVID among the homeless population. Uh, thankfully and amazingly, if there's any silver lining here, uh, that has not occurred in Los Angeles. And part of it is because of something like uh, Project Room Key. So uh, I think we have, to, um, uh, we have to look more toward the longer term uh, and the near term. Uh, and by near term, what I mean is the following, that uh, there's a big focus on permanent supportive housing, and I believe in that. But these are taking three to six years to build. We had a thousand people who died on our streets last year. It'll probably be worse this year. Telling somebody that, you know, maybe we'll have a unit for you in three to six years is not a great response. And it's also having a terrible impact, uh, deleterious impact on, on our neighborhoods throughout Los Angeles. And so as expensive as it is, uh, to deal with it through something like Project Room Key, um, especially when we're getting money from other sources. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think, a, a very good thing for the interim. Uh, so uh, I'll open it up. Um, if anyone has a question, you can, if you can use the raise your hand feature. Oh, that was quick. We already have hands popping up. Uh, so uh, we'll just go through here. Scott Mendel, go ahead. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Ron. Thanks for your time. Thanks for calling on me first. Uh, my concern are unfunded liabilities and the impact oh, yeah. of COVID and the loss of revenue stream for the city, for pension health, infrastructure, debt, bonds, the drop program. Absent a substantial bailout, probably a federal bailout, um, wh what is the time frame until if we go insolvent or there is such a reduction in services, the city is sort of unrecognizable as it was, say, in February. Well, uh, I, I don't believe that we're facing insolvency at any time soon. Um, and I'll say that for the, for the following reasons. Look, when you talk about insolvency, or let's say when you talk about bankruptcy, um, there are one of two reasons that an entity, a company or, or, a, or a government entity uh, is a is a candidate for something like that. And that is either that they don't have the cash flow to meet uh, existing needs, or that uh, their uh, liabilities exceed their assets. Um, the city of Los Angeles has vast assets. Uh, and you, know, you look at how much real estate we own, we, we've got a lot of assets. Not that we're gonna sell them off tomorrow, uh, or should, uh, but uh, we, we're not short on assets, thankfully. Moreover, uh, everybody focuses on general fund, which is very important. But in fact, if you look at our treasury, uh, it's made up mostly of special funds. And many of these special fund dollars do continue to come in. Uh, and we have a, a rather a strong treasury at this moment in terms of all those special funds. And before we actually borrow from any outside source, we can borrow from our own funds, which is a good thing. Uh, moreover, uh, we started before COVID with a, a halfway decent uh, reserve, uh, not nearly enough, but better than most other cities. Uh, so that put us in better stead. Uh, and I don't believe that we're going to be in dire straits for forever. Uh, we, we still have some very good fundamentals to our economy. Uh, we have uh, a lot of creative businesses here, a lot of tech. Uh, there's still a lot of businesses that are continuing to do well. Now, having said that, I have long been very concerned about uh, many of the long-term liabilities. We've got very serious pension liabilities, um, although uh, uh, a booming stock market has helped us uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that. Uh, although how long that goes on is, uh, is another question altogether. We also have healthcare liabilities uh, for our retirees uh, but unlike pretty much every other uh, uh, city in America, we are 50% uh, advanced funded for those uh, uh, healthcare liabilities, uh, which it's not 100%, but it's 50% more than almost every other city in America. Uh, so uh, we are going to have some uh, serious challenges, though, uh, certainly in the coming year. Uh, 
uh, when it comes to cuts. Uh, we're looking at the furloughs, as I mentioned, uh, which is going to mean fewer hours. Uh, we're going to have to look at what is absolutely necessary. Uh, and a lot of this is also going to depend on what we get from the federal government. Uh, what happens in November is going to make a big difference for Los Angeles. Uh, the current administration doesn't have a, a, a huge incentive or desire to help uh, cities like Los Angeles. Uh, in fact, perhaps just the opposite. Uh, but uh, it, no matter who is in the White House, uh, there's only so much uh, uh, deficit spending that the federal government can afford to do uh, before it faces a, a, a serious problem. So just picking up a little bit on uh, the question and, and your answer uh, and mentioning that there is certainly a large amount of property that's owned by the city. I'm wondering, and it's a question actually from a stakeholder who is watching, uh, about your plan, the city's plan to equitably and reasonably make surplus city property available for purchase. That certainly seems like that would be a great way for the city to plug some of its financial, you know, the holes in the financial boat. Well, I, I'm not a believer that we just, you know, sell off property. Um, uh, but I am a believer that we look strategically at our portfolio. And before becoming controller, I, I was an attorney for many years. I was also in real estate. And so I, uh, I really wanted to get the city to think strategically uh, about its portfolio. And mind you, we, uh, in some ways, we're very much a business. In other ways, uh, we're not. It's not just about profit. It's about what is in the public good. Uh, having said that, um, uh, when I, I look at certain kinds of properties uh, that we, the city have that are underutilized, they may not be surplus, okay? But how do we look at, for example, surface parking lots that we own and uh, see what opportunities may there be for public-private partnerships or joint ventures to create uh, some affordable housing uh, and still maintain much needed parking for local businesses. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the uh, LA Mall, which is right next to uh, my office in City Hall East. I don't know that there is a more pathetic mall in America. Uh, and, it's not safe, uh, I'll tell you that. And it's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why it's just a dreadful place. Uh, but uh, it's got a great location. Uh, we, we find ways to perhaps partner with others who know more about how to manage those kinds of properties. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily a big advocate for let's go sell off uh, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, make money, but how do we uh, leverage these in a better way? You look, for example, at uh, you know, Long Beach is a really kind of interesting example. Uh, what they did was uh, they, they have uh, a lot of land which is in their civic center and uh, they put out for bid uh, to developers saying, okay, we want, uh, we want all these new municipal buildings and we want them for free. And uh, in exchange, we'll give you a portion of the land uh, that you can build uh, uh, some retail, some uh, residential on, and uh, uh, and then we get all these uh, all these buildings without actually having to spend money to build them. It's it's a uh, uh, it's a good uh, way for government to leverage its assets, and I think we need to think in a much more businesslike terms. Which is, by the way, why I've uh, advocated that we create a Los Angeles Municipal Development Corporation. Shockingly, we don't have one. A lot of other cities do. It's not brain surgery, uh, and it would involve people both from the private sector as well as the public sector. So thank you. Um, as it relates to furloughs, obviously that's in the news and, and it's yep. going to be, a, you, you yourself mentioned reduced hours. So we as citizens will obviously feel an impact of reduced services. I'm curious about salaries. Um, we know that members of the city council, for example, they make more than a sitting member of Congress. Are, is there uh, any talk or what is your opinion uh, about cuts uh, within council district offices of their staff or of council members themselves, you know, giving, leading with example versus furloughing, uh, you know, an MTA worker or someone who's perhaps providing needed services uh, for the community. Um, there are some council members that have talked about that. Uh, I know for myself um, that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the salaries of council members, as well as uh, for me as controller, uh, are actually uh, pegged to the uh, salaries that are paid to uh, superior court judges. 
Uh, there were increases that uh, went into effect for superior court judges. Uh, and uh, I actually uh, uh, decided to forego that, uh, uh, that increase uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and, uh, and look, if, if, uh, if all of my people are, uh, are gonna take a hit, then uh, uh, I think it's, it's fair to expect that uh, elected officials uh, also need to, uh, to bear some of that pain as well. I, I appreciate that. Um, how has the, and I'm sure you probably expected this question too, we unfortunately, right, as citizens of, of LA, we, we, see, we see corruption. We see uh, six months ago, we see a member of the city council uh, getting picked up. We see then, what is it, two and a half months later or three months later, we see the pandemic. I start to lose track of time. We see Jose Huizar, another second city council member in less than six months is then picked up. Uh, and, you know, this paid, the, the issues of pay to play in the city. Uh, I'm curious, and it's again a, a, quite a great question from a stakeholder. How has the FBI investigation or federal investigations uh, impacted cycle of audits or any impact on your office? Well, uh, we, um, uh, we don't do criminal investigations in our office. We have a waste, fraud, and abuse unit, uh, uh, although I would barely call it a unit because over the years, the monies for it have been uh, cut and cut and cut by the city council. Uh, uh, let's be frank, uh, auditing is not uh, sexy. And uh, uh, investigating waste, fraud, and abuse is also not sexy, uh, but is, uh, in my opinion, absolutely necessary. Um, what I've tried to do is, is use the very limited resources that we have also in a way to create uh, the um, open data site that we have. Uh, in that, uh, I'll be frank, while my title is uh, uh, controller and the um, watchdog for the people's money, it is impossible to watch everything. But putting it up online for everybody to see and for other people to be sort of part of that process, I think is really important to try and, uh, and create not only greater transparency, but greater accountability. Uh, now, uh, while we do not do criminal investigations, uh, when we do uh, have a sense that something criminal is going on, um, we have uh, cooperative relationships with a uh, city attorney, with the DA, uh, and also with federal authorities. And uh, uh, we, of course, uh, help in each and every single way that we can. Uh, I am uh, angry and I am disheartened and I am distressed by the sickening and vile behavior uh, that we saw from uh, uh, these two council members. Uh, and uh, I think part of it is, uh, is a result of uh, poor character to say the least, uh, but part of it is also uh, the system that we have. Um, you know, in other cities, the planning process is one in which uh, uh, community plans are updated with more regularity. Uh, moreover, uh, there's much more certainty. We have a very uncertain planning process in LA uh, where uh, uh, nothing is, is uh, about uh, getting approved what is permitted there, but it's changing what it is that would be permitted there. That's a crappy way to do planning. Uh, but it also opens the door to uh, a tremendous opportunity for misdeeds. And uh, we should have a system where uh, it's less about what the council member wants in their district, uh, even if it's with the best of intentions, and more about real planning by planners. How's that for a concept? Uh, and that may make some people in a community happy sometimes, it may make them unhappy sometimes, but it would be great to have that consistency and also take away some of the temptation for the wrongdoing. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it is a, uh, I, I think fair to say, a broken system uh, that opens the door for a lot of this, um, uh, uh, a lot of these misdeeds. I wanna pick up, shift it, thank you. Um, and I appreciate, I appreciate the full throated um, response. Because um, unfortunately, I, I would say, I, I don't believe that this, that with two members of the council, that this is where it ends. Uh, my guess is most likely, unfortunately, there's more to this iceberg, uh, I fear, uh, just by the nature of the office and even your acknowledgement that the department that invests, 
you know, waste, fraud, and abuse has been systematically kind of chipped away and underfunded. Uh, but the by thing is, the ethics, uh, the ethics commission, uh, has also been systematically underfunded. That's, I mean, that in of itself should, I mean, uh, should sh set every stakeholder, anyone who's paying attention, should set their hair on fire. Um, you know, uh, not directed at you, but that's that's as a taxpayer, uh, that that's just enraging. Uh, I want to see there's a, yeah, there I'll is also a add my own department and look, all of the, our departments are taking a cut. Uh, but I began this fiscal year uh, with an 18 percent cut. Uh, and then you add to that the fact that the overwhelming um, uh, the overwhelming uh, expenses of my department uh, overwhelmingly are staff and, uh, and salaries. And that's de facto a, uh, uh, a 10 percent cut uh, because of furloughs. So that con that uh, translates into uh, pretty much right off the top about a 28 percent cut. And you, is that across, uh, would you say that's a uniform cut across multiple departments or do you, do you see that as more selective that departments were cherry picked where there were greater cuts than others? Uh, you know, different departments actually um, uh, uh, bore the brunt of it somewhat differently. I don't know that it was a result of cherry picking per se, uh, but ironically, um, the departments like ours that had done a good job of not necessarily spending every cent that we had in our budget, uh, while you would think that you'd get rewarded for it, uh, we ended up getting punished for it. Okay, I do see a hand raised. Uh, there, uh, there is a question here. Let's see, hopefully it's a reasonable question or presented reasonably. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, yes. The the goat puppet. Yes. He wants to know about John Lee, the council member, was seen on the third floor walking into your office alone, and apparently he had something to tell you. What was it that John Lee told you, Ron? <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, I, 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 all that I can say is that, uh, you know, our offices have been uh, closed to the public since March. Uh, I have not had, uh, I've, I've had tons of Zoom meetings uh, uh, like everybody else, but I haven't had any uh, personal meetings in my office since March. I'm not, I'm okay. not sure what, what this refers to. Yeah. Uh, now, just to check, um, you had, when you mentioned, uh, the cuts across the board for your department uh, and furloughs uh, were there also within that are there also salary cuts and and just to be clear as it related you said that there were for, I guess pre-pandemic approved kind of built-in yes. raises correct and you it's not that you're taking a pay cut rather it's that you just didn't take the raise I mean I guess it's a bit still a pay cut but you didn't mm -hmm. you're not going below what you currently get paid. Well, actually, the, uh, let, let me just say a couple things on that subject. Uh, first of all, the, um, uh, the, uh, the raises for city employees are, are totally separately calculated from uh, the way that the Judicial Council and Superior Court judges uh, are calculated. So the increases that uh, the uh, council members uh, either took or didn't take, um, uh, or that the other elected officials, including myself, you know, took or didn't take is, is based on that, not on uh, the uh, negotiations that were done by the uh, unions uh, for other city employees. Um, but, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, so many of the uh, civilian employees who are going to be taking, um, you know, de facto cuts, okay, uh, mm -hmm. both in terms of uh, the, uh, the impact of furloughs, which is a de facto 10% cut. Uh, plus, um, uh, there's some questions about whether they will or will not receive uh, the uh, pay increases in the coming year that they would have otherwise received. And it's gonna be subject probably to, you know, a lot of uh, robust conversation and maybe even litigation. But I, I do think it's proper for uh, uh, for us as elected officials to, uh, to also, uh, participate in, in taking that haircut. Uh, I know we're closing, uh, coming 
be mindful of your time. Uh, we have, I think, about five, five minutes or so left. Uh, curious about contracting process with the city. <laughs> uh, no bid contracts. Um, why are those allowed? So uh, I've actually performed a number of audits relating to contracting. Uh, and uh, that too is uh, what I would describe in many ways as a uh, broken system. Um, by the way, most recently I issued an audit looking at um, uh, uh, business inclusion uh, policies in the city. So how do we get more small businesses, women owned businesses, minority uh, or uh, owned businesses uh, to uh, do business within the city. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you how we end up with so many no-bid contracts, um, and it's troublesome. And sometimes, you know, the road to hell is, uh, is even paved with good intentions. Uh, over the years, uh, more and more requirements have been added to what it takes to contract with the city. Uh, even if you are the most business savvy person in the world, uh, you need a consultant to really help you to figure out how to qualify to be a bidder for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and all the paperwork that goes with it. By the way, very well intentioned and sometimes even pursuant to audits that were done by, you know, previous uh, controllers uh, with the idea that we need th this control in place and this control in place and this control in place. But what you end up with is a situation where, uh, uh, where you don't have uh, as broad a group of bidders as you would like uh, and where you uh, uh, therefore don't have as much choice. What you also have is a situation where uh, a lot of contracting right now is done based on piggybacking. And you know we have the legal ability, and, and, and it often does make sense, okay, uh, to say, well, the county has a contract with such and such a company, or the state does. And so rather than go through a year or year and a half process of what it takes to contract uh, directly, uh, we can piggyback on an existing contract that's already been pre-negotiated often at a pretty good rate, uh, and we can do that without wasting a huge amount of time and a huge amount of effort. Uh, and, uh, and already know uh, that we're dealing with a known quantity. Uh, but uh, what that ends up doing is creating a lot more so-called uh, no-bid contracts. Uh, I think, um, I'll tell you what, I, what I've advocated for is, uh, first of all, that we create a, a purchasing cooperative of sorts on the local level. Uh, in which uh, you can get companies that, uh, let's say, are pre-qualified uh, with one agency, such as the city. And if they are, they can also be pre-qualified with, uh, with Metro and with uh, LAUSD and with the county uh, and vice versa. And therefore, we can uh, make it easier on businesses to qualify uh, and we can have a bigger pool and also negotiate, hopefully, better rates. Uh, but... Uh, uh, we definitely need to see uh, reforms in this. In some cases, you'll end up with a, with a um, uh, with no bid uh, because uh, there are so many uh, insurance requirements that we have of certain kind of bidders that there are very few that would qualify. In some cases, let's say like uh, building a um, uh, uh, building a uh, a new runway at LAX, uh, the FAA requirements are so extensive. Uh, that there's only one or two companies in the whole of the United States that actually qualify to bid. So there's a lot of reasons why this happens, uh, but but it's ripe for reform. You know, but uh, so so thank you. Um, so a lot, the last question uh, I'll ask uh, relating, and you kind of gave a hint to it that, and I and I'll confess that I'm eager to read the third uh, audit now of Lhasa. Um, and you mentioned it's coming what's out coming next out, week. Coming, well, what's coming out is not another uh, audit of law. So what's coming out actually um, is a uh, uh, a second audit of Triple H. Uh, Triple right. H is overseen by HCID, the, the uh, Housing and Community Investment Department. That's separate from LASA, which is more involved in the services. Uh, and I did an audit uh, looking at their outreach activities uh, uh, last year. In terms of HHH, how much how much money? Uh, I mean, you also talked about you know fraud and abuse. We talked about building and this. A lot of this, you know, a lot of that actually ties into HHH. This one point two billion dollar, mm -hmm. a taxpayer funded 
pile of money and where we saw, for example, the consultant fees on average on projects were through the roof. I mean, yes, uh, clearly I'm in the wrong business. Every, you know, it, it was, it, I mean, although that actually maybe not because it, to me s seems criminal. Um, I'm curious, are there, are we see, are you seeing in this another audit of HHH? Are you seeing similar to what we've seen before that these numbers are just outrageous that we've been paying developers, we the city taxpayers paying uh, developers and their the handlers, the you know consultants getting away with highway robbery. Well, what's sometimes uh, what's often more troubling than. Uh, uh, than fraud or illegal activity is that activity which is perfectly legal. Uh, right. And uh, I think that's what we see here. Um, the way that uh, these monies are being spent, we, we don't pay for the whole of the project. We just, right. but we put in a portion of the cost. Uh, I'm sorry, forgive me. Pay, uh, could, you, could you point to what our portion of the cost is? Typically about 160000 uh, Per unit. Per, per unit, correct. Now, uh, the problem is that the kind of projects that qualify uh, are often the ones that often need money from the state, they need uh, money in tax credits. There's a whole bunch of different parties that have to come into play. Uh, each of them have to sign off on it, and that can take years. And it takes a lot of consultants, unfortunately, to uh, actually get these projects approved, uh, both from a financial point of view, as well as from a building and safety and planning point of view. Uh, we need, uh, I think, to have a much more simple paradigm, uh, different kinds of projects that don't require as many different cooks in the kitchen. Uh, and uh, that uh, would allow for much more creativity. Now there's about a hundred million that was set aside for so-called innovative projects. And, and I happen to be a big advocate of looking at how do you build it cheaper and uh, faster. Uh, it can be a combination of prefab. It can be looking at how do you create more transitional housing? How do you rehab uh, buildings that already exist? And by the way, we're gonna have an awful lot of empty uh, commercial and retail space uh, uh, in these coming years, unfortunately. Look how many motels are, are, uh, are empty. Uh, and not that that's a panacea, it's not always cheap to do that, but you can do it much more quickly and more cost effectively than building new, which is one of the most expensive ways to create affordable housing. And, uh, and so what I've argued is that we need a different paradigm. Uh, if we keep on doing the same thing over and over again, it's no wonder that it's gotten this expensive. We found some projects with as many as 40% soft costs. And that's not because anybody is performing any illegal activity. It is because we've created a, a monster. Right, a labyrinth of, right, which is fascinating because I would think, you know, if anything we've learned through this pandemic and the city having to learn how to, you know, look at the Al, that sound perhaps sounds silly, but the Alfresco dining program, how suddenly we were able to cut through red tape, we were able to make a streamlined system, yes. to hopefully say, cut off, you know, or save, even if it's but a few, businesses literally atrophying and dying because of forced closures and made a very streamlined will, process. There's a will, there's a way. And, uh, but there are too many people uh, who are invested in the status quo. Uh, and not necessarily because they're bad people and not necessarily because they're uh, involved in illegal activity, uh, sure. but because uh, this is all they know. And, right. uh, and so they are invested in what they know. Uh, but, uh, you keep on doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And, you know, we all know what that is. I think is. that's the definition of, of, of crazy, right? That you're you're yes, doing the same is. thing and expecting different results. That is I want to, if anything, for those that are watching, I just want to say uh, thank you for engaging. Thank you for taking your evening. I hope, tell your friends it's recorded. If anything, I hope this, this last hour has pointed out to us as a community that we really do need to pay attention. Um, if we're not paying attention, then uh, we deserve to be in the position we are as a city. Um, thank you, uh, Ron, for taking the time tonight. I hope we can have you again for the SCNC community and uh, have greater attendance. Don't forget to vote. That's also very important. Absolutely. Um, and of course, all politics are local. So yes. make sure that you're engaging here, whether it's through a neighborhood council 
uh, or speaking uh, out. Thank you for questions. I know I didn't get to all of them. Uh, Ron, if it's okay with you, I, uh, to, I guess they can email your assistant if people have follow-up questions or they go to your website, correct? The controller's website. Um, uh, Mazel Tov again, happy okay. birthday uh, <laughs> for tomorrow. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I wanna close off by saying one last thing, which is Please. that, you know, while we have many challenges, uh, I can tell you about the people who work in the controller's office. And I am so proud of these people um, who are largely working remotely and working harder and uh, longer hours and producing more than ever before. And uh, while, uh, while there are uh, those, uh, as you pointed out in the city, who, uh, who are either not as creative as they should be or who are in fact engaging in illegal activities, I think the vast majority are really fine and caring public servants. And, uh, and I'm deeply grateful for the work that they do and uh, deeply grateful for the work that you on the, your neighborhood council do. And as controller, by the way, uh, I'm authorized to double your pay. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're very generous. For those Thanks. who don't know, the neighborhood council members are paid zero. Right. Uh, but you, are, you, you may now consider your pay to have been doubled by the, by the controller. Yeah. Uh, Very in, nice. In, I, uh, in, in appreciation I'll, I'll for the your bank. work. I'll see what they say. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you again. And you can always send further questions to the controller's office. Visit his website. There's a lot of useful information. And again, thank you to you and your team uh, in the controller's office. Great. Have and thank night. you to uh, Christina, who's on the call as well. She uh, do, does a great job for us. Have a great evening. Stay safe. All right. Stay everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.